screen here. Hi, then. Uh, how's there that? We go. It looks perfect. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. All right, then, then let's, let's begin. Um, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank you all again for joining us for part two of Love and Passion in Art. And I hope you're all well and staying safe and um, able to get your vaccinations. Um, as I look out the window, the sun is shining. And um, I think these love stories might even help to bring a little more sunshine into our lives today. Since the start of human storytelling, I think um, humans have enjoyed great romance stories. Everybody wants to feel some of that romance. And I think visiting the St. Louis Art Museum and the love stories there is a great way to quench that thirst. Um, we all need a little more love in our lives, I think. As we saw last month, and as we will see today in part two, a love story can be a fairy tale or it can be a drama filled Netflix movie. So far, we've seen that love and art come in different colors and different sizes and different textures. And there are thousands of ways it can manifest itself. Um, it doesn't come in a one size fits all box. So we're shining a spotlight on many of them today and the stories couldn't be more different. Love is a powerful emotion and love stories are endless. They've been the mainstream of art, the mainstay of art for millennia. And there's humor in the topic as well, as demonstrated in this cartoon about modern romance. Um, our children today would never believe it, but prior to the digitization of the world, love did exist. Uh, from the allure of Cleopatra to the magnetism of the Kennedys, these love stories and these love affairs have stood as markers in history. Joan Crawford famously said, love is like a fire. Whether it's going to warm your hearth or burn down your house, you never can tell. And the medley of love stories we'll see today fit both of these categories. So let's begin with an age old favorite. One cannot love and be wise. This painting depicts a decision that was anything but wise. Today, beauty contests often lead to arguments amongst competitors and spectators. But in Greek mythology, there was only one beauty contest that would lead to war, death, and destruction. And that beauty contest was the judgment of Paris, one of the starting points for the ultimate destruction of Troy. It all started when someone forgot to invite Eris, the goddess of discord, to a wedding. Angered by this slight, she arrived at the banquet and threw a golden apple onto the table. While versed, of course, in the petty jealousies that were common to the gods, Eris, in an inspired piece of mischief making, had inscribed on the apple, for the fairest. This instantly had the desired effect when Juno asked Mercury to take the apple of discord to Paris with instructions that he should be the final arbiter regarding the charms of the, of the three divine contestants. Excuse me. <clears throat> Zeus might be the supreme god of the Greek pantheon, but this was a decision he was not going to make. For he realized that that would mean that two powerful goddesses would be angry with him. Therefore, Zeus, Zeus proclaimed that the decision would be left to the hands of Paris. Now, the three goddesses knew better than to leave things entirely to the whims of a mere mortal and immediately resorted to that tried and tested expedient bribery. Juno offered to make Paris the ruler of both Europe and Asia. Minerva promised him victory in battle, 
But Venus trumped them all by guaranteeing him the love of Helen of Troy, the most beautiful woman in the world. Known as the face that launched a thousand ships, Helen of Troy is considered one of the most beautiful women in all of literature. In a most unwise decision, Paris, of course, awarded the apple to Venus and then traveled, and then traveled to Sparta to claim his prize. Helen eloped with Paris, but needless to say, this did not go down well with her husband, King Menelaus, who followed them accompanied by the largest army the Greeks had ever assembled. The bloody Trojan War was on and the rest is history or myth, depending how you look at it. Among the most popular mythological scenes produced by Lucas Cranach the Elder and his workshop were those featuring Venus and in particular, the Judgment of Paris. A close friend of Martin Luther, they were godfathers to each other's children. The artist was a central figure in the revolution, and I'm sorry, the reformation. Cranach supervised the printing of Luther's pamphlets, painted altarpieces for Lutheran churches, and produced portraits of Protestant reformers and princes, as well as designing woodcuts in religious scenes. Kronik has been considered the most successful German artist of his time. He developed a, 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 kind, of per, a, a kind of personal recognizable ideal of female beauty, essentially anti-classical, looking back to late medieval Gothic influences. He really had little concern for anatomy. I, I think you can see that here. The women look to be like limp noodles. Some have described his nudes as perfectly imperfect. Which is Juno and which is Minerva is unclear, but the left figure must be Venus, this one right here. It is she who is the most suggestively alluring and Cupid up here is preparing to shoot his arrow at Venus. I love the rouge on the rear of the goddess on the right um, to make her more appealing. So maybe think about which of these goddesses you might have chosen and uh, who do you think would be today's choice if our country were to choose the winner of this beauty contest? In this next painting, we discover Picasso's muse, lover, and lifeblood. No painter, not even Michelangelo, was as famous as Picasso in his own time. And he was the artist that every other artist had to reckon with. Without Picasso, modern art would not be the same. At his best, Picasso, who was really a lecherous old goat, made tidal waves. He challenged accepted beliefs about art and abandoned that sense of absolute visual certainty favored since the Renaissance. The artistic genius of Picasso has impacted the development of modern and contemporary art with unparalleled magnitude. Citing beautiful women as inspiration would become the theme of Picasso's life all the way up until his death. Picasso has complicate, had complicated relationships with many of the women in his life. He, he revered them or he abused them, one or the other. He's been quoted as saying, for me, there are only two kinds of women, goddesses and doormats. He often obsessed with the young woman and she became an artistic muse for him, inspiring many works. All of the women Picasso took as either wives or lovers were painted by the artist. He was notorious for his relationship with women, sometimes two or three women at a time, letting, as he said, the women fight it out. He was married twice and had multiple mistresses. And it can be argued that his sexuality fueled his art. In this painting, a pitcher, a philodendron plant, and a basket of fruit rest on the mantelpiece and are bound together by sweeping black lines. Pablo Picasso often invested his still life with secret meanings. And this work is a disguised portrait of his young and voluptuous lover, Marie-Therese Walton. 
The picture is painted in brilliant yellow and it often represented Marie Therese's hair. While the green apple suggests the form of her breast and the curling black lines refer to the contours of her body. Picasso called Marie his muse, lover, and lifeblood. As the story goes in 1927, in the late afternoon, Picasso noticed a young 17-year-old woman through the window of the Galleries Lafayette in Paris. He waited until she came out and then greeted her with a big smile. Mademoiselle, he said, you have an interesting face. I would like to paint your portrait, he added. I'm sure we will do great things together. After all, I am Picasso. Married at the time, the two began a scandalously intimate re relationship almost immediately. Because of the highly questionable nature of their relationship, it was kept secret from most of Picasso's friends and family and wife. My life was, with him was always secret, Marie Therese said, calm and peaceful. We said nothing to anyone. We were happy like that and we didn't ask for anything more. Then in 1934, Walter became pregnant with their child. And after Picasso's wife discovered this, divorce proceedings began. Walter and Picasso were still not allowed to live together, but she moved into an apartment a few doors down from him. The new family lived together for a short while with Picasso playing father. However, two months after his daughter's birth, Picasso met Dora Marr and soon embarked on a relationship with her. Picasso supported Marie Therese and her child financially, but he never married her. On October 20th, 1977, four years after Picasso's death, Marie Therese committed suicide. Picasso produced an incredible 20,000 paintings, prints, drawings, sculptures, ceramics, theater sets, and costumes. He amassed a personal fortune in a superb collection of his own art, many of which were paintings of Marie Therese. He died in 1973, leaving an artistic legacy that continues to resonate today throughout the world. I just think this is such a funny cartoon because some have wondered why Picasso would need a model at all. This next painting is about unconditional love and it's kind of, it's kind of a heartbreaking tale. It's called Attachment. This painting is about love, but love between man and his best friend. The one absolutely faithful friend that man can have, the one that never deserts him is his dog. And that trait is heartbreakingly depicted in this painting by Edwin Landseer, painter and sculptor to Queen Victoria. The painting illustrates Sir Walter Scott's poem, Helvellyn, about a faithful dog that guarded her master's body after he had fallen while mountain climbing. Though the body went undiscovered for three months, the dog stayed to ward off ravens and foxes that might have scavenged the remains. Edwin Landseer dramatizes a scene through vivid contrasts of light and shadow. And by placing the man's body at the bottom of the composition, which he emphasizes the great height from with which he fell. Now this is a, a verse from the poem, so get your hankies ready. How long didst thou think that his silence was slumber? How many long days and long weeks did thou number? Ere he faded before thee, the friend of thy heart. Oh, so sad. Let's punish would be the title for this popular story from the Apocrypha. This is a story of a, this is a fan favorite. Everyone loves this painting. The biblical heroine Judith came to the rescue when Gener General Holofernes and the Assyrian army laid siege to her city of Bethulia. Boldly infiltrating the Assyrian camp, Judith dined with Holofernes, seduced him, and once he was drunk, she beheaded him with the help of her maid, Abra. Judith put the head on a spike 
held it up to show the opposing army and they fled in fright. It's a story of the consequences of an attempted seduction and has been a favorite story of feminists for centuries. The story used to pose copied from Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, portraying Judith as a physically powerful woman, a visible indication of her inner courage. Several years ago, a 10 year old boy on one of my tours commented on Judith's muscles and said that she had arms like Mark McGuire. Out of the mouse of babes, I think. Giorgio Vasari, the painter, was one of the foremost artists of 16th century Italy, renowned not only as a painter, draftsman, and architect, but also as the author of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, a series of artist biographies that form the basis of modern art history. It's filled with gossip about the lives of Renaissance artists and you can still order it, I think, on Amazon. It really is a fun read. It's all about gossip. It's great. His lives remain perhaps the most popular early work of the history of art. So Giorgio Vasari arguably invented the field of art history. He coined the term rebirth or Renaissance to describe what had been a series of developments in the history of Italian art from the 13th century onward. In short, Giorgio Vasari branded the, the Renaissance, giving it the image we associate with today. Though he was not Michelangelo, I mean, I mean really who was, um, he was a marketing genius and he was a workaholic. He and his army of assistants could and did complete projects in Italy on a grand scale. Vasari worked for the mighty Medici clan. This painting is an homage to Cosimo de' Medici. Judith's jewels, though if you can see them, you know, here and, and here, Judith's jewels are a um, are taken from the collection of antique jewelry that Cosimo de' Medici prized. So it was a tribute to Cosimo, and yet it was kind of a sales pitch as well. Look, look what I can do. Um, Vasari was the man most responsible for promoting the Medici family as patron of the arts, and they in turn promoted him. Vasari glorified with reverence the, a long series of creatives who graced Italy and later the world with their masterpieces. This painting holds, holds its own with the best of its time, and the story, as my husband would say, is ahead of its time. A true power couple would be the title for these next two, two sculptures. These two elegant bronze statues of Shiva and his wife Parvati in their original Hindu temple setting would have awed and inspired a Hindu devotee. They are made of cast metal and reserved for sacred processions. Long poles would, scary, would carry the sculpture, draped in silk garments and garlands of flowers through the streets on festival days. They would put the poles through here. Shiva on the left combines a single image, uh, in a single image, his role as creator, preserver, and destroyer of the universe. Parvati, his consort, is alongside Shiva. She is his energizer, known for her wifely dedication and devotion to Lord Shiva, a true power couple. Shiva has many guises and many representations in art, but the most popular is his, of the dancing figure within the Arch of Flames called the Lord of Dance. It is an image seen in museums and temples across the world in his rich in iconography and hidden meaning. So let's look closely at the sculpture. Shiva's hand gesture signifies reassurance. He also holds in his upper right hand, the drum that makes the first sounds of creation. His upper left hand holds the fire that will destroy the universe. 
Shiva has four arms, a way to indicate that he has superhuman powers. The snake represents egotism, the dwarf or demon lying under his foot is ignorance, and the tiger is man's beastly nature. Shiva destroys those things that can destroy us. Parvati, consort of Shiva, is commonly depicted alongside him. Sculptures such as this were intended especially for festival use. There, the deity would be transported on a carriage through town like a royal guest, having first been bathed and perfumed and dressed. The opportunity for the public to see and be seen by the deity embodied in this image was considered one of the most auspicious aspects of worship. Parvati's love and devotion are overwhelming and all encompassing. When Shiva saw her and realized how beautiful and powerful she was, he was unable to resist her. The two were married in a sacred ritual performed by the gods. Some say that a worship of Shiva is useless without worshiping Parvati. She is the mother goddess in Hinduism, carrying the divine energy between man and woman. Statues of Shiva are almost always shown with Parvati as a constant companion by his side. Nora Ephraim's caustic quote might be appropriate for this couple. She said, husbands are never dead when you need them to be. The most important woman in the Flavian period of ancient Rome was Emperor Domitian's wife, oh, excuse me, <coughs> was Emperor Domitian's wife, Domitia Longina. It's thought that Domitia was involved in the murder of her husband in 96 AD. So this is not a love story of myth. They were literally at each other's throats. My husband said, it was love at first gripe. Following Nero's suicide in 68 AD, the Roman Empire plunged into a year long civil war. The crisis came to an end with the accession of Domitian's father, Vespasian. He reestablished peace in the empire and founded the short lived Flavian dynasty. The Colosseum was erected during this time, and it was Domitian the son who built the first palace complex on Palatine Hill, where a succession of Roman emperors would live for 200 years. The last three years of Domitian's reign were characterized by a vicious cycle caused by his fear of revolt and assassination, which led to cruelty and tyranny and executions. He had bestial virgins executed and buried alive harassed and tortured philosophers and Jews. He executed officials who opposed his policies and confiscated their property. And this in turn led to more plots and eventually to his death. Domitian was a very jealous man and malicious rumors were propagated by hostile senators regarding Domitian's alleged misconduct with an actor. The emperor did not take insults directed at his marriage lightly. He divorced Domitia in 83 AD. Reconciliation between them eventually took place and she was again allowed to be part of the ruling family. However, as time passed, Domitian became increasingly suspicious of everyone and put to death anyone he believed to be disloyal. It is thought that Domitia may have found her name on a list of people suspected of disloyalty and became part of the plot to assassinate Domitian. The plot was carried out in 96 AD and Domitia lived on for several years well respected by the citizens of Rome. Domitia's personal personality managed to penetrate the smooth face peering out from the elaborate coiffure. These kind of banana curls illustrate a characteristic hairstyle of the female elite at the time. It was also a convenient place to hide small vials of poison. What, what else? I mean, I, which I think it's kind of interesting. Domitia was married to one of the most neurotic Roman emperors and one imagines a will of iron drive and determination 
that must have helped her navigate through her rocky marriage. We can only envision the unstable times in which they live as well as the emotional ups and downs that were part of their marriage. The next relationship can be summed up with the old saying, I can't live with you, but I can't live without you. Though so they created some of Mexico's most fascinating art, it is their bizarre beauty and the beast dynamic that has captivated the world. The volatile relationship between Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera is not your typical love story. They had messy fights, multiple extramarital affairs, and even divorced only to remarry a year later. Their relationship was far from placid. Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera first met when Kahlo approached Rivera as an art student seeking advice on her career. Though he was already married, the two fell in love and married in 1929. Their relationship was tumultuous, filled with infidelities, heated arguments, and impossible tempers. They divorced in 1939, but remarried a year later. Theirs was a typical case of, I can't live with you, but I can't live without you. The two inspired each other's art tremendously and often show up in each other's paintings as well. When they married, her, her parents called them the elephant and the dove. Rivera was older, a political activist, a celebrated master of frescoes who helped revive an ancient Mayan mural tradition. He gave a vivid visual voice to indigenous Mexican workers seeking social equality after centuries of colonial oppression. This painting is not what we typically think of when we think of a Rivera painting. He developed his own brand of cubism infused with symbols of his Mexican national identity. He focused on revitalizing and redefining Mexican culture in the wake of the Mexican revolution from 1910 to 1920, a decade long conflict that killed more than a million citizens. Flamboyant, irreverent and unforgettable, Frida Kahlo created arresting and at times disturbing works of art 55 of her 143 paintings are self-portraits, which speak of her vivaciousness and personal tragedies. You now it's hard not to become mired in the tragic details of her life, from childhood polio to a tram accident that smashed her pelvis and to a gangrenous foot that resulted in the amputation of her leg. Frida Kahlo's hauntingly beautiful face broken body and bright costumes had become her trademark. She magically wove from chronic physical pain, paintings of a severe and mysterious beauty. Controversies surrounded their two marriages, including his affair with her younger sister and her affair with communist exile, Leanne Trotsky. The open relationship between Diego and Frida that had survived other affairs broke up when Frida found out about Diego's romance with her sister. Through it all, to Frida, Diego was her other half. After her death, Diego formed a trust to turn her house, the famous Casa Azul, into a museum to commemorate the love of his life. Together, they were two of the most important artists of the 20th century. The love between Frida and Diego was palpable passions and resentments, adoration and pain, define the intense entanglement of Kala's and Rivera's love story. Oops, I did that one already. Lady Esther famously said, I married beneath me, all women do. Um, I have no idea if our next wife actually felt this way, but I really wanted to use this quote. Um, I, I, I love the quote. I think it's, it's really great. Um, so that being said, let's look at our next couple. 
Franz Hals was one of the most foremost portraitists, portrait artists of 17th century Holland, known for his depiction of Dutch upper class citizens. We don't really know the identities of these two subjects. We don't know anything about their life, but we know they were husband and wife. Contrasting the amused expression of the husband with the, the slightly more and serious demeanor of his wife, Halls captured the details of their clothing as well as their personalities. The woman presents a demure and approachable demeanor, the very essence of a respected 16th century wife. Her clothing, although not flamboyant, shouts wealth. Black was the most expensive dye and probably came from the Spanish court or church. Cloth was in itself expensive and the voluminous dress therefore reflects luxury. The gown was handed down, good clothing should not be wasted. And the lace cost about a year's salary for an average worker, all signs of her family's prosperity. In these paintings, you can see the spontaneity of Hall's work, the strong sense of personality of the sitter and the attention to details. You can even see, if you look closely, the veins in her hands. These portraits were created during a conservative phase of Hall's career when sober and elegant portraits were favored by wealthy citizens in Holland. These were painted during the height of his popularity and were painted without first doing a drawing or a study. So the forms and textures were suggested rather than delineated, giving his work a kind of lively and fresh quality. Hall's own love story, if, if you want to call it that, is a bit sketchy. He was twice married and had 10 children, and he was always in debt. The popular image of him is as a drunken brawler, and it's been suggested that he led a debaucherous lifestyle and characterized his life as, a, as just being filled with heavy drinking. Hall's posthumous, posthumous reputation is one of very bad behavior. According to local records, the second wife was constantly in trouble with the law and was arrested at least twice. Hals fell into debt and court records show that he had to sell his belongings, a handful of furniture and paintings to pay off his debt in 1652. He spent the last years of his life in relative poverty, but received a yearly pension from the town administration indicating that he was still a self-respecting, a, a well-respected citizen. He died in Harlem in 1666. This unknown woman sat for the artist together with her husband, whose portrait is on the right is now in the collection of the Nelson Atkins Art Gallery in Kansas City. And every so often our two museums have a family reunion. The next story is a Romeo and Juliet tragic story. Late in 1919, in a squalid Paris studio strewn with wine bottles, Amadeo Modigliani painted a wistful portrait of his 21-year-old lover, Jean Habutin. A few months later, on January 24th, 1920, the impoverished artist died of tubercular meningitis at age 35. The following evening, Jean, eight months pregnant with their second child, leapt to her death from a fifth story window, a tragic Romeo and Juliet story. When Mondigliani met his last and most devoted lover, Jean, she was a promising art student of 19. She promptly moved in with him, leaving her petite bourgeois family a guest that she'd taken up with a failed artist and a Jewish one at that. The couple shared a, ramsh a ramshackle apartment where according to a later tenant, one could see the sunlight shining through the walls. Jean was slender with almond shaped eyes, a pale complexion and long light brown hair. She was so reserved the friends could not recall ever having heard her voice. Modigliani introduced her as his best beloved, an endearment he apparently never used with any other woman in his life, and he pledged in writing to marry her, 
although he never followed through. Amadeo Medigliani had a tortured life straight out of a Harlequin romance. He was your typical romantic genius. Handsome, poor, proud, amorous, drunk, ill, and he died in early death. The legend of his troubled life and early demise and the subsequent suicide of his young fiance has tended to overshadow his significant artistic achievement. The life of Modigliani so often resembles a legend it's difficult to determine fact from fiction. Where it remains of this extraordinary man is a body of work that modernized figurative painting. Often characterized by their elongated bodies and blank eyes, his subjects are distinctly Modigliani. His work is simple, serene, sensuous, moody, and influenced by tribal art. If Van Gogh is the quintessential mad genius, Modigliani is the quintessential bohemian alcoholic. Modigliani really was a dashing, drug-using, womanizing wastrel. Some people nearly swooned at his suave, cultivated manner, while others found him an unbearable buffoon or a boring drunk. He always wore a bright silk scarf knotted around his neck and believed that artistic talent was no excuse for not dressing well. Mondigliani's work doesn't fit into the standard art historical categories like expressionism or cubism or impressionism. To be so exclusively focused on portraiture was very unusual, if not unique in his time. But Mondigliani was happy to stand apart. Once when he was asked what he called his style, he retorted haughtily, Mondigliani, when an artist has to stick a label on his work, he's lost. Of course, it is Modigliani's style interpretations of languid, melancholy women that are best known today. The woman in this painting was one of Amadeo Modigliani's favorite models, a young woman known by only by her first name, Elvira. Her bright blue almond-shaped eyes reflect the artist's trademark interest in stylized forms. He painted this portrait a year before his death. The painting was donated to SLAM by Joseph Pulitzer. He said that his son titled it, The Little Girl Who Wouldn't Eat Her Spinach. <laughs> I suppose she does have a sort of petulant body language. A critic said that nonchalance, it, nonchalance is her uniform. During Mondigliani's short and difficult life, the going rate for his elegant, oddly distorted paintings was less than $10 and takers were few. A landlord who confiscated some of his work in lieu of rent used the canvases to patch old mattresses. Last November, an anonymous bidder at Sotheby's auction house in New York City paid $31.3 million for a Jean Abertan portrait. The public has always loved Modigliani's works, its elegance, its refinement, its panache, and people are always drawn to a tragic love story. All's Fair in Love and War fits, the history, fits this history story to a T. Zenobia, the subject of this sculpture, ruled Palmyra, which is present day Syria, for six years after her husband's death in 267 AD. Palmyra was a, a desert oasis that had developed into a major economic metropolis of the Near East. Nicknamed the Pearl of the Desert, Palmyra grew out of an oasis known for its date palms. Because of its location on the western edge of the Silk Road and the eastern frontier of the Roman Empire, Zenobia's Palmyra was, on, uh, was a city that was on the verge of greatness. Zenobia assumed power and was a shrewd diplomat and military strategist. She herself was still not yet 30, but as young as she was, the queen was well-versed in governing. She knew that she would have to act fast if she wanted to govern after her husband died. So she pulled a move that 1200 years later 
would be known as the Medici Maneuver, installing her young son as king and naming herself Queen Regent. She challenged the authority of the Roman Empire in the East. She led her troops, an unusual role for a woman in antiquity, to victories in Egypt and Asia Minor. Her actions changed the empire's eastern frontier and she was celebrated for courage and daring as she expanded Palmyra's territory. The Roman forces eventually overpowered her armies and she was captured. Zenobia's army was utterly destroyed and Zenobia was put on trial. Roman Emperor Aurelian marched her in chains as part of his triumphal procession through Rome. In the legend, when Emperor Aurelian glimpsed Zenobia's dignity and beauty while shackled, he fell in love with her and freed her. Although defeated, Zenobia's regal bearing led to her pardon. Hosmer conveyed those exact qualities in this popular culture. Only the chain and the slight downward tilt of her head betray her status. There are historians who believe that after publicly humiliating her, the emperor gave her a villa in the Italian countryside where she lived out the rest of her days in quiet retirement. Some say she remarried a nobleman or a senator. And some say that her children married well and her lineage continued for hundreds of years. The dignity of this figure's profile with her head held high and the intricate details of her ancient dress testify to the sculptor Harriet Hosmer's sophisticated carving abilities. Hosmer, one of a group of 19th century female sculptors working in Rome, held strong feminist beliefs. She saw in Zenobia an embodiment of a woman's ability to move beyond the constraints placed on her. Zenobia's bearing stresses her strength rather than her victimization. At the height of her reign, Zenobia was one of the most powerful women of the world. She took on the Roman Empire and she captivated an emperor. Never underestimate the power of jealousy to destroy hmm. is one interpretation of another story from mythology. Stories in Greek mythology are really first-rate soap operas, and this one is no exception. In the myth represented here, Cephalus is an expert hunter who married a pretty lady named Procris. These two are super in love and everything is great until, there's always an until in, in these myth stories, isn't there? Cephalus loved to hunt, and he'd been given gifts from the gods, a javelin that always hits its mark, and a dog that could outrun any other animal. Selfless and Procris's Mary gets kind of iffy when some gossip tells Procris that Selfless is cheating on her. The busybody hears Selfless, who's hot from hunting, singing for Breeze to come and cool him off. The gossip thinks that Selfless is calling for an old flame and tells Procris that Selfless was flirting with another woman. Procris decides to go and spy on her husband while he's hunting. Cephalus hears something rustling in the bush and hurls his super accurate spear. It's really too bad that the spear never misses its mark since in this case, it's Procris hiding in the bushes. She died in his arms. Like many of his contemporaries, Widowall used contrived poses, exaggerated proportions, in kind of sulfuric, acidic colors to tell his story. A sad and tragic love story that is so commonplace in mythology. Plato said love is a grave mental illness. And this, is, this story is a, has a sad ending to a very famed life. Nijinsky, the subject of this sculpture, was perhaps the greatest male dancer of the, earliest, earliest of the early 20th century. 
He was celebrated for his virtuosity and for the depth and intensity of his characterizations. He could dance on point, a rare skill among male dancers at the time, and he was admired for his seemingly gravity-defying leaps. He may have been the greatest ballet dancer of the last century. In any case, he was ballet's first modernist choreographer. In his 20s, he made a series of ballets that challenge academic dance as Picasso around the same time was challenging painting. If that wasn't enough to ensure his notoriety, there was Nijinsky's personal story. In 1909, he joined the Ballet Russe, a new ballet company started by Sergei Diaghilev. The impresario took the Russian ballets to Paris, where high quality productions such as those of the Imperial Ballet were not known. Nijinsky became the company's star male dancer, causing an enormous stir among audiences whenever he performed. In ordinary life, he appeared kind of unremarkable and was pretty much withdrawn in conversation. Now, Nijinsky and Diaghilev became lovers. And Diaghilev was deeply involved in directing and managing Nijinsky's career. His relationship with Diaghilev was complex and serious and many say genuine. They were both preoccupied with the ballet as well as with each other. Relationships, relations between Diaghilev and Nijinsky deteriorated under the stress of Nijinsky's becoming principal choreographer and his pivotal role in the company's financial success. So inexplicably, in 1913, while on tour with the company in South America, Nijinsky married a woman that he hardly knew. Sobbing shamelessly in Russian despair, Diaghilev bellowed accusations and recriminations. He cursed Nijinsky's ingratitude and his own stupidity and dismissed Nijinsky from the company. With no alternative employer available, Nijinsky tried to form his own company, but this was not a success. He became increasingly mentally unstable with the stresses of having to manage tours himself and deprived of opportunities to dance, his mental condition deteriorated. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia in 1919 and committed to a mental asylum. For the next 30 years, he was in and out of institutions, never dancing again. He did not work, indeed he rarely spoke for the rest of his life. He died in London in 1950. Many believe that he was heartbroken to have lost not only his career, but the love of his life, Diego Love. For love or duty is the question posed in this story. In this painting, Aria is shown visiting her husband Pietus who had joined an uprising against the Emperor Claudius and was later imprisoned. Pietus was condemned and given a very usual choice for a senator. You could either be executed and lose your property um, and anything that you would give your heirs, or you could commit suicide and your heirs could retain your property. In the end, Arya set an example for her reluctant husband by stabbing herself in the breast first and handing the dagger to him with the words, Pietus, it doesn't hurt a bit. She reminds him that suicide is the honorable option for a Roman prisoner. It was as though she was telling Pietus that his cowardice hurt her more than the dagger. It was an incredibly popular story at the time, although I don't know why, with Aria representing a model of strength and moral conduct. The painting has focused on the moment just before Aria inflicts the wound. The story was a sort of subject used by artists like Francois Andre Vincent to demonstrate his mastery of elements of classicism evident in his use of stage-like settings and, and his just his incredible attention to details. Although Vincent earned praise and esteemed of his contemporaries, few of his major works are known in the public today. Nonetheless, he demonstrates a technical ability unmatched by his contemporaries. 
1790, Van Sant was appointed master of drawings to the king. The story of Aria and Pietus is not Romeo and Juliet. These are not star-crossed lovers. The death is a social convention, it is an act of personal protest against the regime. 18th century artists understood the suicide as duty, not love. This is a great story, I think. It's called A Colossal Pair, and it's the title of the next painting, as well as, I think, a great description of the subject. Frank Dillon, the artist, captures the 60-foot-tall grand statues of Pharaoh Amenhotep III and his wife Tai, which still stand on the plain of Thebes today, known as Luxor in Egypt. Such mighty remnants from Egypt's, ancient Egypt's glorious past evoke thoughts of former grandeur and present day decay. Hence Dylan's sense of desolate solitude. The towering statues silhou silhouetted against the setting sun represent the end of a powerful and dominant civilization. And the frame is original to the picture, by the way. So who were these people and what was their relationship? Well, the reign of Pharaoh Amenhotep III marks the zenith of ancient Egyptian civilization, both in terms of political power and cultural achievement. Dubbed the Magnificent, this 14th century BC Pharaoh brought in an era of marked prosperity, political stability, and the creation of some of Egypt's most magnificent complexes. He depicted his wife, Queen Tai, in an unprecedentedly egalitarian fashion. Their relationship was revolutionary. Amenhotep deliberately commissioned statues showing himself the king and Tai as the same size, showing her importance in the royal court, which is on a par of that with the pharaoh. In a culture in which visual size is everything, bigger was better. So a big king and an equally big queen showed them as equals. The egalitarian portrayal is pretty much unpre unprecedented, showing Amenhotep's devotion to his wife, allowing her to wield influence comparable to his own. Tai even takes on masculine regal poses, showing up on her own throne as a sphinx who crushes her enemies and getting her own sphinx colossus. Now she not is only, she's not only equal to the king in a way, but she's taking on his roles. Tai became her husband's trusted advisor and confidant. Being wise, intelligent, strong, and fierce, she was able to gain the respect of foreign dignitaries. She continued to play an active role in foreign relations and was the first Egyptian queen to have her name recorded on official acts. Amenhotep III ruled Egypt for nearly four decades until his death in 1349 BC at the age of 50. Tai is known to have outlived him for as many as 12 years. Same antiquity, these statues have acquired legendary status. Tai's legacy carved out her unorthodox, unique role as partner to the pharaoh. There's no love loss for any of the men in this artist's life. In our second to last piece, Artemisia Gentileschi may have been only 19 years old when she fashioned the exquisite image of this mythological Denai. The story unfolds as Denai's father was told by an oracle that his daughter's offspring would destroy him. So he locked her in a chamber impenetrable by potential suitors. Undeterred, the god Zeus fell instantly in love with her and transformed himself into a shower of golden coins and impregnated Danae. She eventually gave birth to Perseus, who went on to have many heroic adventures, such as killing Medusa. One day, Perseus was in a competition and threw a javelin which hit an old man by mistake, his grandfather. The oracle was right. 
The very, this very early work shows Artemisia's accomplished handling of the female nude, as well as her brilliant depiction of textures and textiles. You can, you can feel the velvet and, just by looking at it. And incredibly, it's painted on copper. She was really a talent. But Artemisia's life story is a tragic one in many ways. In her story, there was no love lost. In 17th century Europe, at a time when women artists were not easily accepted, Artemisia was exceptional. She challenged conventions and defied expectations to become a successful artist and one of the greatest storytellers of her time. With painted images, she fought back against the male violence that dominated her world. Genileski was tortured in a Roman courtroom in 1612. Ropes were wrapped around her fingers and pulled tight. Across the court sat a man who had raped her. No one thought of torturing him. Defiantly, Genileski told him that her thumb screws were the wedding ring that he promised. She put her life into her art. And what a brutally damaged life it was. Being the daughter of an artist was the only way a young woman could hope to learn the complex skills it took to paint professionally in the Baroque age. It seems that her father, Orazio, had ambition for his daughter as her skill developed. He hired an upcoming artist, Agostino Tazzi, to give her lessons. Then in 1612, Tazzi was accused of raping Ar Artemisia. The resulting trial lasted seven months and shocked Rome. It made Genileschi a celebrity in the worst possible way. Amazingly, every word of this court case survived. Genileschi speaks to us from this 400 year old document with a voice that is eloquent, courageous and compelling. It's a rare example of a woman in the pre-modern era taking a stance against the oppression that was just part of her day-to-day -day life. The trial also featured months of meandering witness examinations, friends, tenants, artists, and relatives who built up a picture of Genileski's household. She's portrayed as a teenager who spent all of her time painting, rarely going out. Her rapist, meanwhile, emerges an even worse character than they first thought. Several witnesses claimed he'd even murdered his wife and he could offer no good, no good defense. Yet General Lesky was the one tortured and Tazzo, Tazzi was set free. Why? Well, he was protected by the Pope uh, because his art, which today is forgotten, was raided at the time. Everyone knew he was a villain, but it didn't matter. He had papal concern. Janileski was still a teenager when the trial ended and she was shamed in a culture where honor was everything. Yet it also provided a kind of, kind of monstrous publicity. By the 1620s, she was a successful artist working as far from Rome as she could get. And she was taking revenge with the only weapon she had, a paintbrush. She could not write her story because as was revealed during the trial, she was more or less illiterate. She could paint it though and change its ending. Nevertheless, her later career was extraordinary. She swiftly became recognized as one of the most accomplished artists of her day and accommodated patronage that included the Medici family and King Charles I of England. In 1641, Genileski lived in Naples where she lived out the rest of her life. Instead of a sword, Artemisia was armed with a brush. Centuries before feminism, Genileski is the maker of her own image, a hero of her own life. Let me suggest a couple of books that you all might enjoy on this topic. A Passion of Artemisia by Susan Vreeland and Artemisia by Alexandra Lapierre. Both bring to life Artemisia Genileski as the authors capture the flavor of Baroque Italy as well as the emotional life of this really fascinating woman. A marriage of equals is the symbolism of this last object. This piece recalling the shape and design of vessels from ancient China is known as a double vase, a nuptial or marriage cup. 
The two halves of this vessel are connected by a hidden channel that kept the level of the wedding wine equal, regardless of how much was drunk from one side or the other, thus representing the ideal of an equitable and stable marriage, a perfect ending for our tour. So these stories, their plot twists and the art they inspire have tapped man's imagination for centuries. We've seen a bit of all in these love stories in SLAM. So thank you so much for joining me on this adventure through love and passion. I hope these stories will inspire you to see these masterworks at the St. Louis Art Museum as soon as you're ready. Um, stay well and safe and we hope to see you next time. As Groucho Marx said, I was married by a judge. I should have asked for a jury. So are there any questions or comments or couldn't we talk maybe a little bit about the judgment of Paris and what you think you might have chosen or that our country might choose today? Um, how do we do this? Should we go out of? Go ahead and stop okay, sharing. There we go. There we go. And then, um... If anyone has a question, you can type it in the chat or raise your hand. Susan Bossy, you have a question? No, okay. <laughs> There's something in the chat room. I don't know what they are. There were, um, actually there were from earlier in your talk, um, there was a question from Lee about how large are the Indian sculptures? I think that was towards okay. the beginning they're, of they're your- They're about um, like this, they're, you know, maybe maybe the, the statue of Parvati is maybe this big. Um, the one, the Shiva one is bigger. It's probably maybe about this big. Can you see my hands? Is that, is that, can you, is that describe it okay? Okay. I think so. Um, I'm not sure if Lee's still with us. Then Al had a question. And again, this was early mm -hmm. on. Um, any significance to no right hand? That was the question. Um, and I think it was the, the one or the first or second thing that you were, a uh, piece that you were talking about. No right hand. I don't know which one he's referring to. Yeah. Um, I'm well, not sure that he's still on. So the next question, Nancy, uh, would you please provide the recommend recommended book titles? So if you would like, you could, um, Dale, you could send them to me and I could send them on. Or okay. Nancy, would you like to, um, would you like to ask anything further detail? The book, the books are really very, they're, they're interesting. Um, one of them is a lot more detailed, a lot more academic. The one by Susan Freeland, I think is a novel based on her life. It's not um, necessarily as academic as the other one, but they're, they're both really very good. Her life was, her life story is very, very interesting. I've read other things by Susan Freeland. So she's a good author and uh -huh, she is. interested in that one in particular. Yeah, it, it really brings it, it brings, you know, you kind of feel like you're there. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, yeah, I think, I think it, it just kind of um, puts Rome also, puts you, puts you into Rome in the, in the, in the 17th century, um, which I think she does a very good job with. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. And the, um, the, the missing right hand, that was the, the Pavarti statue. Oh, no, I just think, I think that, oh, okay. I think it was just, um, you know, they've just been damaged mm -hmm. over the years. These, that's not how it would have been. She would have had it, she would have been, she would have had hands. So, um, um, does anyone else have a question? I'm not seeing any at the moment. So I don't know. I think it's, it's kind of interesting to talk about the, um, um, about the judgment of Paris with children and to see which one they would choose. Um, you know, when you think about would you choose wisdom or would you choose um, wealth or would you choose beauty? 
which of the three is the most important. And it's interesting to see what most of the children say and what most adults say, um, because I think we all have different approaches in our lives. Thank you so much, Dale. I don't see any further questions today. It was a wonderful program. We are so happy to have you return. And I believe that we have a third in this series of love art. Is that correct? And I uh -huh. think it's April the 12th. So please join us again, um, April the 12th for the next uh, final series, final of this series, Love and Art. So thank you so very, very much. We really thank appreciate you. and it gives us so much information and, and it's fun. I really like it. I hope everyone else does too. I do too. Well, I hope you all stay safe and, and um, maybe by April, we'll all be able to be outside. That would be wonderful. It would be nice. So we'll see you next month, everyone. All right. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.